And we're live. Hi guys, welcome to Beyond the Lecture, where we talk everything and anything education. My name is Aaron Rao. Today in episode 2, we're going to chat about something that's close to our hearts, or rather, our pockets. We're going to talk about the cost of education. Let's face it, education costs money. It's one of the few concerning factors for lower to middle income parents, or even part-time workers, who are sometimes uh, facing financial planning for their children and for themselves. So this might even be one of the reasons that birth rates are on the decline. And of course, with COVID-19, it just adds another layer of complications or concerns. So we're going to talk about all this. What are the factors behind the cost of education? Is it even a worthwhile investment in a post-COVID economy? Should you even go to college at all? Okay, so I was looking through my contact list on who should I invite for the show. Uh, It's not that my contact list is very long, but you get what I mean. So I thought, who better than my own boss? So the person who runs PSB Academy himself, the CEO, Mr. Derek Chang. Say hi, Derek. Hi, Aaron. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. Good, huh? All right. So before we get into all this, allow me to make clear of the fact that we all work for PSB Academy. PSB Academy pays the bills for all this. And it is within this context uh, that we work to give our best and most honest opinions in our discussions. All right? So Derek, the cost of universities are getting higher and higher, right? The average cost of a degree, um, I won't name the universities, but averagely the cost about 20,000 plus to about 30K, right? At some other universities, it might go all the way up to the hundreds of thousands, depending on the field of studies, right? And uh, a recent survey by a bank, right, suggests that parents in Singapore spend a total about 70,000 USD, by the way, um, on a children's education. And if your child goes overseas right, for university, the cost will balloon up anywhere between 100,000 to maybe 200,000 plus. If you're studying at a, based on a four-year degree at Harvard, for instance. Okay? So with all that in mind, okay, don't you think that, especially in today's current financial climate, parents should be worried, shouldn't they? Well, thanks, Aaron. I think that's an interesting question you're asking about the cost of education. Um, No doubt the cost of education has increased over the last 10 years or so. Um, But we are mindful that it's not just the cost of education has gone up. The cost of general living has gone up as a whole. The manpower costs, rental costs, everything costs that university phases and education institutions like PSB phases will continue to grow each and every year. And in order to keep up with the inflation costs in, in phase by the institution, inevitably fees will be going up per year. So should parents be worried? I, I think at, at the same time, I think we also need to be mindful that, um, of course, pre-pandemic, pre, pre-COVID situation, our remuneration and the general um, raise of salaries and disposable income has also been generally on the rise. So it's sort of um, balanced it off in, largely in, in, in that sense. Okay. But you see, you, you, you've been running PSB for a number of years now, right? So uh, you probably have a good idea of what goes into the costing of an average co- of an average course or a program right so could you give us broadly an idea of uh, the the elements or the areas that you must consider before you decide on pricing a certain course I think as, as uh, looking at just PSB Academy as a whole I think the biggest cost at facing an institution like PSB mm-hmm. is manpower costs I okay. think that's critical and, and manpower costs is largely driven by teaching stuff teaching academics, teaching professors, teaching academic staff who is teaching on the course. I mean, obviously, we want to be able to give the best education for our, for our kids, for our students and to, our, I mean, to, to the parents. I think, therefore, the reason that we need to invest in education continues to be teaching staff, the ability to hire better teaching staff, the ability to hire industry-relevant people. I mean, we could be teaching law, for example, not that we offer law in PSB, but we could be teaching law by having a full-time academic but in fact, we don't. I mean, most of most of philosophy points to the fact that we wanted to hire practitioners who can then bring experience from the industry into the classroom, mm-hmm. and these practitioners will be earning a lot more, a lot more in their own field of work. So, in order to entice them to spend some time teaching our students, the cost of remuneration will have to go up, and I think that brings the value of education. It nothing beats the fact that you can listen to a marketing professor and a marketing practitioner on the ground who is able to share with you his or her experience in the field. And, and that's really driving the, the whole experience that, that we're trying to offer to our kids. Great. 
But you see, this gives a good segue to what I want to ask next, which is you can hire marketing professors. That's great. You can hire a, a, a lab professor or a chemistry professor, you know, mm. and uh, they are great. But at the same time, these same group of experts are delivering uh, their expertise and their know-how in an online platform, which some may argue, you know, I'm paying X amount of money, right? But I can get it online for so much cheaper, minus the title of a degree, minus the title of a diploma, because, well, um, some online platforms just can't offer those titles, right? So, but they're getting the same knowledge. Okay, I put it in quotes because it's mm. the same knowledge. Mm. So, what what is your say on that? What do you think about that perspective? I, I get asked this question a fair bit during such a um, pandemic time. Mm. Um, I, for one, believe that the value of education is not in the knowledge that they get in class. Uh, I think that's, that's, to me, is very, very important. Why, why do I say so? Coming to college, coming to a degree, going to an education institution, is really not about going into the classroom and sit there, um, exit the classroom after three hours and say, that, hey, I'm a marketing graduate, I'm a, I'm a finance graduate. No. Knowledge can be learned from class. But knowledge should be internalized outside classroom through social setting. The ability to interact with people, the network that you built, the context and contacts that you built in education institution last you a long, long way. And that is really the true value of education. You could be picking up classes online through whatever platform you'll be learning about, learning through online. I learn economics micro, macro easily. I mean, you go to YouTube, you go to any channels, you, you can be able to pick knowledge. But how do you internalize that knowledge? Is that discussion with your fellow friends, the, the debate, the robustness of that debate, the robustness of that interaction with your friends. I, for one, has been making good contacts and friends from my university days are lasting friendships. Mm. Do you get in online space? I mean, you can get WhatsApp calls, Zoom calls, mm. whatever calls you want to, mm. but nothing beats that interaction. And the value of education really... I would, if I want to boldly plant it there, it's 50% the content you've gotten from, from your tutors and lecturers, but the 50% comes outside the classroom and that's valuable. Mm. But you see, a, a student that signs up for all this, or at least if they're thinking of signing up for all this, will they know the value of these things? Is it explained to them uh, up front before they even consider the course? Because all, all that's in their mind is, okay, I have to come to school for next two years, three years, right? And I have to pay X amount of money for that. So the the main consideration for them will likely be, okay, do I pay for this coming to school physically or do I pay three times less or four times less or even sometimes free to just watch something online? Mm. Do, do they realize this or not? I, I Maybe I'll play as devil advocate okay. I mean, in, in response to your question. Um, just bring ourselves back a year. Okay. In 2019, mm. um, 2019 September. If let's let's bring ourselves back, eh? and um, at that point in time, before COVID happens, before before the pandemic ro rolls out across the world in the, in the, with a vengeance, mm. um, the number of people that we get, at least in PSB, for online education is low. Mm. The number of people coming there is low, and 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 when you try, I mean, we did try to launch some online programs, and the first reaction we get from our students back then is, hey. I don't want to do it online. And we ask why? You're getting the same content online. The answer is, I need the interaction. Mm -hmm. So, what st the students explicitly know about it? I don't think they explicitly know about it, mm -hmm. but implicitly in their mind, college education, a degree, a, a qualification, is really not just about coming to school. It's really about uh, not sorry, my, it's not just coming to attend a lecture, but it's really about interacting with the classmates. Right. So the questions we get from students back then was, you know, how many hours do I group lectures, uh, group group tutorials, uh, the group work that we are doing, project work. That's where we're getting. So instead of just coming to the fact that you know students and or, or you the the value of education is about interaction, in in their mind, they have the they have that that baked in. If not, if not online education has been much more higher as compared to now. So, mm. so on that note, I, I don't think students are, 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 are not explicitly no, but in the mind, this has really been baked in to a large extent. This just sort of struck me at this moment because if uh, the trend of online courses keeps going on and, keeps, uh, and if the takers of online courses keeps going up, is there a concern that because of the interaction that's missing 
from uh, physical classes, you know, the interaction, the uh, the consultations and the, the group work, all these dynamics gets taken away. And of course, at this moment, it's because of the, it's because of the pandemic, understandably so. But if this continues, will there be a growing concern of the quality of the graduates that you'll get because of fully online courses? Because who knows when this thing will end, right? And uh, if, say for example, you might end up in a situation where you have a, a batch of thousands of students who are graduating, who basically went through their entire degree or, or tertiary education in an online setting. Will this eventually have an impact on uh, their employability and their soft skills as a graduate? Well, this is the first time I'm getting this question. In- interesting question, I would say. Mm. Um, but I, don't know, I think if you look at it in, the, in, in, mm. in, in, in context, I think what drives a person is, is really about your personality. Yep. I think um, we have to make do with the best of situation. I think if, if, if this situation continues in, 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 in a lot, much longer pathway, then I think it's up to individual students to be able to reach out to have the conversation, to build the network through online means. Mm. I mean, as an education institution, we are committed to help students build that, 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 that pathway, mm. to provide that environment for them to build that online. But, but it's important to, 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 to sort of reach out through your tutors, through your fellow uh, friends about how, how we can build that connection. What, one thing which caught me um, largely during this, uh, this pandemic is I had a conversation with my academic staff a couple of months back. Mm. And I ask people about the online programs and how, how, how is it coping. Um, interestingly, the lecturers are coming back with one point. They, they say students' involvement, students, um, uh, the way they interact with students is, is missing. I asked the lecturer, what do you mean? He, she said, specifically she, she said, I want to look into the student's eye. And from that eye, I will be able to know whether he or she internalized what I said in that context and that's missing in the online space and, and, and the proactiveness of the tutors in the classroom setting to look in the eye and say Aaron I think you need a little bit more help right. it's missing in the online space and I think for students who are facing such situation in, in, in current situation it's the ability to reach out not mm. to be shy reach out and say I need help and by doing so they can make do and they can make catch up with the, the kind of the soft skills that they were missed out in, in, in the physical contact setting that's true. That's true. Okay, so going back to the whole idea of costs. See, recently our very own minister, Mr. Chan Jun Singh, right? He mentioned that in three years, because of what hap- what's happened in COVID, our economic development has been wiped out, right? Three years of growth, just gone like that, right? So as a part-timer, you know, um, or as a, or someone looking to be a part-time student, working a full-time job, or as a parent of a school leaver, should you still should you consider at some point putting education in the back seat or should you just take the plunge spend that money putting yourself in a position of a middle income family you know the fear is tangible right so should you at least consider t- like don't go don't pay first keep the money first you know you need that cash flow in the family or do you continue because you, you really have no idea what to expect right i i I think facing with a pandemic situation, especially such such point in time, I think students, I mean parents itself, I think they, we really need to be mindful that education is not something that will reap your return back in a year or two. Mm. It's really a lifelong achievement. And, and, and I think it's important to continue to push on with education. I think there's no better time than right now to go back to education, to look into it. I mean, obviously, the cash is going to be a concern. Obviously, affordability is a concern. But this point in time, because it's pandemic, many, many institutions are playing the social, the, the CSR component to, to find ways and means to help students upgrade themselves. I think government has been launched many, many schemes to help students um, pick up skills or, or education. And I think this is the right time to sort of push forward to, 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 to sort of use the ta- downtime. I mean, unfortunately, if parents would be because of retrenchment or, 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 or some form of financial difficulty, reach out to your education institutions to have a conversation. And I think it's still important to push that because the value of education will not be immediately gained immediately, but it's a lifelong thing. You have 20 years, 30 years ahead of you. Mm. And, and we need to be concerned that not just at three years. What happens if, if you decide to push back mm. the, the, value, the education to a three year later on because of family um, situation, you need to conserve cash and, and, 
and push it back by three years. But when economy recovers, you don't have the ability to come back to mm. teaching, uh, to, to, to education because you will be busy with work. And then because of your lack of skills mm. or lack of knowledge, you wouldn't be able to climb the corporate ladder. Mm. So, so you'll be setting yourself back by another three years. So that will be a good six years gone. Yeah. So you've taken a little bit of a bullet, balance yourself in financially. Um, I'm sure you have a way out. Mm. That's true. That's true. You see, but the thing is, you see COVID, uh, when, they're, when, they're, when you're paying 20, 30K for a course, right? What's happened in the last few months is that COVID sort of exposed, right? How poorly prepared the education sector is really is. I'm talking about the physical education, right? When dealing with online delivery, there are there are platforms who've been um, who started doing online from the get go, right? There there are many platforms who are not doing that. Although they do not offer degrees and diplomas, they are very good at delivering online content, and we are playing catch up to that extent, mm-hmm. right? Because they are the experts of doing so. We are the experts of doing physical, mm-hmm. correct? So. And with again, especially with YouTubers, mm. you, you can see it. You know, every time I, 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 I go to YouTube, you see, wow, they're doing so well teaching online, right? Especially teaching things like, um, I don't know, it, it, explaining economic terms, explaining certain theories in good five ten minutes. You you really get you know you really get the feel of what they're doing and how well they're doing it. Mm. You know, so. Based on this context that we are playing catch up, one would wonder, isn't it? What what can we offer, you know, especially at this time, comparing ourselves to them? I think you're not wrong to say that the education institutions are playing a fair bit of a catch up in mm. terms of the the online provision. Mm. Um, I, I I I I myself watched a video. I would say maybe five years ago. Mm. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen that, that video in YouTube or in a, in a Facebook about um education institution remains fairly the same 150 years ago and 150 okay. years today. Exactly. The same row by row facing a whiteboard or facing a blackboard. Right. What has evolved is blackboard has turned into whiteboard. Yep. Whiteboard has evolved into PowerPoint screens. Um, but everything else stays the same. Mm. So, um, but I'm happy that COVID sort of pushed education institutions speed up in, mm. in terms of what we're trying to offer Mm. There. There's still a fair bit of a catch up game that we needed to play. But then again, I'll go back to my earlier point. I think the online space provides um, people with the skills, people with bite sized information, the ability to, to answer a specific question what is perfect competition? Mm. Or what is this medical term? Mm. I think for such snippets of information, go to platform like online education is perfect. But going back to what I said earlier, Education is not just about content understanding. It is about content internalization, the robust discourse that you would have with your friends and, 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 and friends. And that is where knowledge is built upon knowledge. Knowledge acquired continues to be knowledge earned, but not evolved unless it's debated upon or unless there's major discourse around it. And I think the value of physical academy, physical institution, provides that evolution stage for your, for your knowledge that you will be earning or you'll be learning from, from, from your tutors. Mm. So I, I, I still think that we can do more, much more, and I'm happy to some extent that the, the, the side effect of COVID is to push education to, to speed up mm. adoption of online, but the relevance of offline education continues to be strong. Mm. But what do you say though to parents who, who uh, you know, I, I've I've read somewhere that parents are, and some in some cases students, uh, it may not be in Singapore, could mm. could be in uh, some other countries in the world, but they're literally suing the schools mm. that say that hey I didn't pay thousands of dollars to watch videos, huh? They they literally did that. So w- what do we do to ensure that you know they can their money is still worth it? I I think for 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 education institution who who continues to just do their do whatever they want to do by delivering classes online only and stop short of that needs to relook whatever they're doing. I think I, I won't say for everybody, but in, 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 in PSB we do we do it a bit differently. What what we have been doing is that instead of just delivering classes online, we are continuing to engage students online. We don't just stay and, and sorry, you attend Economics 101 and, and that's it for the week. But our student affairs division, our career services, our counsellors, um, teaching staff, tutors has been reaching out to students to have a discussion, mm. to have small group discussions, to have a chat about how things are. Counsellors there to run sessions. We have um, sports club running some form of uh, exercise online to engage. I think the keyword is engage. 
students are, are, are saying, no, I, I mean, you're right. I mean, if I, if I, if I can get the same information online, why am I, why am I paying you? Mm. So I think the, the issues about is what, it, it, we need to go beyond just content delivery. How do we have that genuine connection? And telling students that this is important because we need to ensure that you are mentally sound, you're able to continue to, to operate effectively, you're continuing to engage with people. And it's a temporary solution that we're trying to make do. So I think we need to go beyond just content delivery. Mm. Okay, good point. Now, on to the next phase of um, the, the current situation, assuming that, you know, in the next few months, we're going to go through changes, right? Um, the government is probably already thinking of ways to sort of kickstart the economy, um, sort of restart, getting back to uh, a resemblance of normality. So in that context, what do you think the government can do or should do? Should they increase spending in education or should they look at it at a more conservative fashion at this current moment? I think Singapore government has always been credited for being very forward-looking in, in mm. all the policies. I think education is something that they will never stinge on. Mm. I think the continuous spending on education. I think um, back then, I think um, if I can recall, I think um, DPM Heng Sui Kiat has announced that government will be relooking how to build a new platform for MOE to deliver uh, online education. And I think that's, that's something that we should be looking forward to. Um, I don't think government will be stinging back on education. It, it, it is a lifelong thing and it is a, it's a way to build talent for the society. And ed education is a first step. Basic fundamental education built up thinking skills. The skills acquiring bit happens in when they are in the workforce. So I, I don't think, I don't see Singapore government stinging back at all. In fact, I think they'll continue to invest in education so that talent can be further built upon. That's great though, but... That's a great. That's a good thing. Assuming that the the government and the economy already has that buffer and has already has that money to spend and to invest on education, but to think about all those countries that at this moment need to borrow money and possibly even go into debt, and those debt will have to be paid for by the current students, the students who graduate, the the future workforce, right? So, do for those uh, people, right? Do they spend? Do they still take the same approach or do they play the conservative game? I, I, I think it's important to recognize that each country has its own different kind of economic environment mm. and its own economic progress in the whole, 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 whole scheme of things. Mm. I think going back to Singapore context, Singapore has been investing in education since the day of independence. Mm. I think we continue to pump in. There's many, many schemes put forth to upgrade the school context, to, to hire more teaching staff. Um, that, and that is the, that is the economic uh, strategy and, and education strategy that Singapore has been implanted. I mean, has been doing for the last um, 50, 55 years mm. or so. I'm, I'm inability to comment on whatever other economies are doing, but um, for, the, for countries that can, can continue to spend on, on education, they will continue because the long-term implication of spending on education is the building of talent. Mm. And with talent being there, it can then can drive the economy as a whole. Okay, good point. Now, I, I'm not a self-professed expert on, uh, mm. on government policies, mm. right? But what I do know is that what we have is uh, we have what we call MediShield, mm. right? Where uh, a certain amount of income is being saved up uh, to sort of pay for your medical bills in the future, right? Should there be something similar put aside for education? I think Singapore launched some form of an EduSafe account for students. I think um, that's where government gave some of a grant to students. Um, to every Singapore student, if I can recall, um, and, and they are able to use that kind of grant for, for activities outside the curriculum. I think having said so, we must also recognize that Singapore education, public education in Singapore mm. is highly subsidized. Mm. I think um, if I can recall when I was a kid in, in my primary school and secondary school, mm. I, I think I paid less than $10 per month if I can recall. I mean, I don't exact, exactly remember what's the amount, but... My primary, secondary school and college education is highly subsidized. Mm. Even to the level when I went to National University, um, it's highly subsidized by the government. So the kind of um, grant that has been there is, is to provide extra, uh, for extracurriculum. Mm. And I think that's something that government has already been doing. Mm. So to encourage students to go beyond curriculum. So I think they've done a lot, a lot in, in, in whatever they can be doing for, to, to spur education along. Mm. Okay. The Future Together initiative, mm. all right? So tell us more about it. Um, before I tell you a little bit more about Future Together initiative, I think it's important to look at why, why we did that. Mm. 
I think when we first start, when when the first pandemic hit um, Sing- Singapore back then, um, we weren't we were in a lucky state. Our students were able to continue paying their fees, although we are starting to see students having uh, some difficulty. And we have parents, we have students, we have parents write in to 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 say, hey, uh, my mom lost a job, my my dad lost a job because he or she is in F and B sector, and with a circuit breaker been there, I'm unable to pay my fees, or there are my 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 dad or my my dad could be a Grab driver or a, a PHP driver, they they can't afford to pay the fees. Can we have longer time longer time to pay the fees for 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 the kids? Um, we we sit back and say that increasingly we're getting a bit more requests from students coming their way. Mm. And, and what we are worried as an education institution is we are worried that students are starting to defer their studies by virtue of just pure affordability. Mm. They are now saying, I can't continue with the next semester because I, I can't afford to pay the fees. Mm. And we sat down as a management team and said, hey, you know, we are still doing okay. Mm. As an institution, we are still doing fine although difficulty has set upon us, but we continue to be getting all the grants and support from government. Why not we take a partial of these grants for support from government to return back to the students? Mm. And we decided to embark on what we call a Future Together initiative. Mm. What we aim to do is, we're telling students that we are paying, we are waiving off one term of your school fee for certificate and diploma students Mm. so that you don't have to worry about. You can start off as a new student, you can start off with us, not have to worry about any payment, any um, tuition fee payment for the first term. And then when you, you commence paying school fees only for the second term. Having said so, we decided we shouldn't just look at new students. How about our current students who has been with us? Mm. So we decided to retrospect that, that scheme to anybody who's joined us in, in first half of the year who is pursuing a diploma and certificate program to either give them a goodwill credit as part of the program so they can continue using the credit to offset subsequent installment so that so that we're trying to minimize number of students who need to differ as a result of, of the pandemic. Mm. It is a little achievement that we have done, totally funded from our own income, a $3 million. We aim to sort of affect 2,000 over students mm. uh, for this year. Um, it's a bold move, I would say, yeah. but I think it's important to, to go ahead and help our fellow citizens um, in, in trying to achieve so, so that students don't get locked down, don't get backed off by delay the graduation, getting out, not being able to study for one term. And that pains us. Mm. I think it's important to continue driving. And I think that's a good point to drive the morale of our students. You see, what I'm thinking of is, is will there be a, a group of students who say, for example, they, they, they hear this good news of Future Together Initiative? Yep, great. So they sign up for the, the first term, right? And that's paid for, correct? What if they can't afford to pay the next one? So is, is there any buffer given to them or do they have to show some kind of a collateral that, you know, um, I can afford paying the next few terms. I can mm-hmm. finish paying this. So is there this kind of rule that is uh, sort of uh, put upon them before they sign up? I think many people was uh, looking at us and say, oh, what, what document do I, do I need to submit? Do I need to send? Yeah. Do I need to show retrenchment letters from my parents? I, I was like, no, I mean, we don't need to. I and mean, when government gives out grant, mm. it's, um, it's t-shirt to everybody. And I think we should do the same thing for, mm. for our kids as well. So we decided to say, no, there's no need to do that. Go ahead and just come in to do the first term with us. I mean, um, we, we, we generally believe that um, people are tight right now. We're hoping, of course, to say the pandemic will be over soon. Um, but we have provision. Students who, 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 who are unable to afford a fee subsequently, I think we'll be looking at the ways to help them tie over the situation. We'll be linking up them up with self-help groups. We'll also be looking at ways to help them defray the cost fee through longer-term repayment. Um, most institutions say, no, you, you, must, um, you must clear all fees before we distribute you your certificates and, and stuff. Mm. But we're saying, no, I mean, look, on good faith, we are allowing students to pay beyond their graduation. I mean, it's a good faith that we have been doing and we will continue to do to help our fellow Singaporeans tie through this, this difficult period. Okay. All right. So, side question. Mm. Okay. Do you think an individual or perhaps even a family should go into debt funding education? A tricky question. Mm. My, 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 my sense is going to debt for education is something that has long-term gain. Mm. Uh, a long-term gain which can have a very good positive return of investment. And and so long as a debt is well-managed, mm. 
I mean, obviously, the, the last thing that the family should be doing is to take on debt through your credit card bills so that you incur 27 or 24 percent rolling interest. Yeah. And that's not something that's very nice. Mm. But I think going through an education scheme, going through an education um, uh, loan to some extent um, on, a, on a smaller interest rate and um, funding over a longer period um, is a wise decision because the ability to recoup that investment is going to be a lot higher. Than, mm. than, than other form of investment as a, as a more internal achievement. So you think that education insurance is a more prudent way of uh, saving up now, wouldn't you think? I think it's a long, it's a long term, it's a long term thing. I think mm. not, not just in, I think in Asia society as this is where we are, yep. I think the concept of long term education, the, the concept of education being a way out of poverty yep. in many, many countries um, from, from young, I mean, I was told by, by my, my parents, you know, if, if you want to get a good life later on in the future, you need to do education. Mm. And it's, it's something that's angering each one of, every one of us. Yep. And I think that continues to be driving the, the whole thing today. Mm. And, and it's true, I mean, in order to get a, a hit in life, you need to have skills, you need to have qualification, you need to have content. And that's important to, to, to go ahead. Mm. That's true. Because I ask this because I, I what, I'm a new parent, Right, mm-hmm. so I just have a boy who's about turning too soon. So mm-hmm. it, it, it's it's interesting how how much you you start to think, right? Okay, um, raising this boy, how how much is he going to cost me? Right, <laughs> especially on the on the on the front of education, because at this point I'm already paying for his education, you know, for the insurance and uh, all these saving stuff and whatnot. So got me thinking, you know, it's 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 not easy. And especially if uh, it's o- the cost is only going to go up, mm. you know. So with, with that in mind, you know, what other options of funding do you think um, people in Singapore, right, whether it's citizens, PR, or anyone who's looking to study in Singapore, what other funding options do they have that they can they look at that they can look at aside from getting a bank loan? I I. I, I think as I mean, you came back to say well, you're a young parent. I mean, yeah. your boy is about two years old. Mm. I mean, I'm not an advocate whether it's good for in education insurance or mm. any form of other uh, financing in the future. Yeah. But it's important to save up. Mm. I mean, a, again, the concept of an Asian concept of saving up for rainy days. Mm. Um, is it raining? I think it's pouring right now. Yeah. Is it thunderstorm? Not yet. I hope we're not going to do a thunderstorm era. But I think the concept of saving up continues to be a virtue that we need to drive into everybody. Mm. And I think um, once you have that notion of saving up, fin- financing for education is no longer a major issue as you go down the line. Especially if you're a Singaporean or a, or a Singapore PR, I think the kind of uh, support for, for early stage in education, um, your primary, your, your secondary, your, your, your polytechnic or your uh, high school I mean, e- equivalence here, it's a well, very well taken care of by the Singapore government. Mm. It's a higher education where you need to think twice about what option you want to take in the future and, and, how, and, and how and when and what you're going to be doing. So I don't, I don't think it's a situation that no... And I think if I can read I mean, between the lines and you know how our government has been doing, I don't think anybody has denied an education in the public education, in yep. education that um, if you can't afford to pay. Mm. And I think that's something that our government has done a, a, a great deal with. Mm. So I don't think as, as parents or, or, or as somebody, a citizen or, or PR needs to be too worried about um, basic education in Singapore. I think we have, government has committed largely to do it. It's at a high education level. What kind of education you want to go for and what is it that you need to do and that needs to be taken care of. You can't, if you can't afford a full-time education by virtue of um, uh, affordability, um, consider part time where you're working and studying, and this is a great way because you'll be learning uh, whatever you learn the content back to your home, but back to your workplace. Mm. So I, I think that's a way to sort of um, spur yourself on in 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 trying to set realistic goal and realistic outcome for yourself. Okay, so say I'm a part time, uh, say I'm a full time worker who just lost my job mm. because of what's going on. Right, mm. I want to upskill. I want to mm. reskill. Mm. You know, that that those two terms are being thrown around so often nowadays, right? Um, should should I consider going back to my early question? You know, earlier during uh, this uh, interview, during this conversation, is that do I really do I really consider the whole idea of uh, reskilling and upskilling? And at what age should I consider this? Because if I lost my job at a, at, in my twenties or in my thirties, maybe I can still pivot. Maybe I can still change. Mm. But what about those who lost their job in their fifties? and in their late 40s, mm. you know? 
the the mentality must be different mm-hmm. because even though even if they're single or if they have a family to to to, to pay for these are things that they have to consider very strongly mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. what is your answer to that I I think it's important to differentiate what exactly that he or she is looking out for. Mm. So I mean, if you need if you need to look for skills, I mean there there are plenty of schemes available by the mm. government in terms of um, reskilling yourself, mm. um, picking up a new skills in a new sector, moving yourself into a new sector altogether. Um, I think plenty of skills available, plenty of funds available to help you uh, uh, re retool into another new sector on there. But what, what, what an education institution provides then is how do we add on to your skills, not just skills, but in terms of knowledge, general knowledge across the board. Mm. I mean, you talk about 40-year-old, 50-year-old. Um, as, if I can recall, uh, three years ago, we have a student who is in her 40s mm-hmm. who is studying in my biomedical degree. Wow. A pharmaceutical science or biomedical degree. Mm. And um, all important because the person wanted to explore a new way. The person may or may not be in the sector. Based on what I understood, the person was not in this sector at all, but wanted to see whether how she can use that skill to apply into a new sector that she wants to join. She wants to go into a perfume industry where biomedical component, chemistry component becomes a lot more important. So it really comes back to, to individual into what sector they want to go for and what kind of skills they want to go for. So if you aspire to, uh, aspire to, learn, to pick up management skills, if you aspire to, to grow up corporate ladder uh, in terms of there, not just people skills, but the management, the strategy important. And that's where the MPA comes in mm. to, to play. But if I am keen to join the healthcare industry, I want to be a nursing staff, I want to go into healthcare, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't pick up a master's in business admin. I'll go for some conversion to be a nurse or to be some of a healthcare assistant. So I think it really boils down to what, what the aspiration of people is. Um, have a conversation with people, both in the skills segment and the education segment, to sort of open up options on, on, on where, where, where he or she aspires to. I think my, my takeaway from uh, this episode is that when thinking about education, it's always important to think about it as a long-term investment, right? Even though it will cost you some sort of a short-term spending, whether it's whether it's ten thousand, twenty thousand, or thirty thousand, um, every situation is different. You know, everyone is facing their own struggles, mm. and uh, I think we, on our end, we are doing our best mm. to accommodate all that, especially with the Future Together initiative. So, what is your takeaway? from this episode that you want others to sort of remember if they forget everything that they've listened so far? I think you're right, Aaron. I think important to do every situation is different. Mm. Put your own perspective. Put on your own head, thinking hat and explore what is the issue that you want. What, what is it that you want out from, from, from education? If, if the concept of education is just earn more money, uh, I think it goes beyond that. It needs to be doing, doing things. How, how do you want to use your education for the future? I think that's the first step, importance that you want to make. Mm. And what is it your aspiration that you want it to be? Mm. And I think, think long term. Education is never short term. I would never understood why am I learning um, certain med- medical equations or certain mm. chemistry equations in my life. Um, do now, I'm still, uh, I'm still exploring why I'm learning those. <laughs> so important to have a lifelong learning, mm. a long term perspective, think through long term, and then you will see how, how you can help to make it happen. Great. All right. So with that said, thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Aaron. So if you guys would like to learn more about uh, what PSB has to offer, our courses, and a little bit more about Future to Get an Initiative, feel free to go to our website, Google PSB Academy, and I'm sure it will show up in your search results. Okay, with that said, thank you for being on the show. All right, and uh, we'll see you guys again in the next episode. See you guys soon. Talk to you guys again.